welcome to the third lecture in the Modernicana series. Uh, and uh, yeah. uh, as we've already discussed uh, the, the origins uh, of the modernism in both America in, and in Europe, today I will move uh, to discuss uh, the heyday of modernism in America, so the 1950s. And uh, I will concentrate on the issue of public housing uh, in New York City. Uh, okay, let's start. Uh, although the prevailing image of New York in the first half of the 20th century was that it was one of the greatest cities in the world, if not the greatest, it was far less advanced than its skyline dotted with numerous skyscrapers would suggest. The reactions of many European visitors, some of which were discussed in the last month's le lecture by Grzegorz Piątek, pointed out to the fact that New York was a rather weird combination of utterly modern architecture and surprisingly outmoded urban planning. Its haphazard urban fabric with high-rise apartment buildings and office towers that stood in a stark contrast with low-standard walk-up tenements intertwined with small factories and warehouses was nothing more than a great chaos. Soaring numbers of new residents made it extremely difficult to manage such a disorganized metropolis. And in that sense, modernization understood as harmonized and organized development was not a mere whim, but an ardent necessity for New York City. And probably no one could better understand this necessity than Robert Moses, the man who orchestrated New York's modern transformation from the 1920s up until late 1960s. Uh, it is quite difficult to assert who Robert Moses actually was. At one point of his career, he occupied more than 10 managerial positions in various departments of the city's administration. And his enormous power over the decision making, making, making made him responsible for most of the changes that occurred in New York in the mid 20th century and gave him the title of New York's master builder or the king of New York City. <laughs> uh, uh, as the changes he had orchestrated have been harshly criticized, Robert Moses is often vilified as, and his entire legacy condemned as being the most important factor in the decline of New York City. Although in some aspects it is difficult not to agree with his critics, it is impossible to perceive him as the ultimate villain who destroyed the entire city. And as much as I would love to delve into defending Robert Moses' visions, this is not the subject of today's lecture. Nevertheless, it will be useful to make a brief overview of his earliest projects that mark the way for the future of urban development across America and ultimately became a major source of inspiration for the post-war policies dealing with urban renewal. Uh, from the very beginnings of Robert Moses' career in New York, it was obvious that his main objective was to create some kind of parallel dimension to the congested urban tissue of the biggest American city. The first part of his involvement in this mission came in the 1920s, when, as the park commissioner, he constructed a whole system of magnificently landscaped parkways leading towards the green expanses of Long Island. And here you can see one of the examples of such a parkway. Uh, shortly afterwards, he created Jones Beach, which in the late 1920s, using the words of one English journalist, was the finest seashore playground ever given the public anywhere in the world. And apart from these grand projects, during the 1930s, he built a network of small neighborhood parks equipped with modern playgrounds, but he also put a lot of attention to erecting facilities that promoted active recreation. Most notably, uh, he was responsible for funding funds to build numerous new public swimming pools scattered around the city. And here you can see Thomas Jefferson's swimming pool from 1936. Uh, I can add that uh, this was one of the most modern uh, swimming pools uh, in the world back then, as it had, uh, it was equipped with uh, underwater lighting and uh, very complicated heating systems. Uh, but when discussing the legacy of Robert Moses, it is impossible not to mention his biggest and often very criticized accomplishments in the domain of transportation. Thanks to his impressive abilities in acquiring federal and state funds for costly road construction, he was able to come up with one of the first well-integrated systems of urban expressways and crossings. One of the best examples of his involvement in this kind of modernization is the Triborough Bridge, opened in 1936. Although the name of this venture suggests that it's one bridge, in fact it's composed of three independent structures that created the first permanent link between the boroughs of Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx. 
Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time for further discussions of Moses' early influence on New York City's fabric, but I hope that after looking at the sheer scope of these projects, you can grasp the sense of the vision that he had in mind. Although already perceived as a model by the late 30s, mainly thanks to Robert Moses' projects, New York City was still ravaged by many social ills that translated into its urban fabric. Probably the most painful problem of that time was the one that troubled social reformers, philanthropists, and mayors for more than five decades. It was housing. Uh, since the first tenement regulations introduced in 1879, not much was improved in the area of housing for the poor. Old law tenements, which in the 1940s still consisted the majority of housing stock in the city, were at least, using a very light term, unsanitary uh, in many ways, as only one room in the three and four room apartments received direct light and air from the street or yard. These types of dwellings were standing in stark contradiction to all the principles of good living conditions that were praised by the reformers of the progressive era. And surprisingly, not much had been done to improve the situation prior to the 1930s. The first attempt to tackle the problem of housing conditions came in the New Deal era, specifically in 1934, when the Federal Housing Administration was established in order to boost the economy and provide un uh, unemployed architects and construction workers with jobs. Even though at that time it was considered a major step towards new possibilities in rearrangement of housing regulations in American cities, the FHA responded mostly to the needs of private developers who were eager to finance only middle and upper class developments. Housing the poorer residents was utterly uneconomical from their perspective. Yet at the same time, some interesting things started happening in New York City. Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, a remarkably progressive politician who assumed the office in January 1934, was the first New York's mayor who understood that without any serious changes in the urban fabric, the city would probably fall apart, fall apart in the near future. In strict collaboration with Robert Moses, he came up with a comprehensive plan to upgrade almost all of the aspects of the public realm in the city. Public housing was one of his major concerns. It was quite refreshing for the public housing advocates from New York to see that LaGuardia was serious about the problem and that he did not favor the interest of real estate magnets. Shortly after assuming the office, he said that public housing, and here a quote, will be in competition not with real estate, but with disease and poverty, end quote. Uh, in the New York's context, 1934 proved to be groundbreaking also because that year the state legislature passed a bill allowing to create housing authorities in the major cities of the state and most notably, the New York City Housing Authority, commonly known as NYCHA. From its inception, NYCHA treated public housing as a logical extension of all ongoing modernization programs led by Robert Moses. In a sense, for at least a few years, NYCHA was independently pursuing the vision of New York City's master builder. Nevertheless, its program was far more abstract and experimental than Moses' projects. Just a quick glimpse at the first board of the authority reveals the fact that as much ambitious and creative its members were, uh, they were prone to fall into a trap of cheerful idealism. LaGuardia appointed Langdon Post as the chairman uh, and Mary Semkovich a social worker, the Reverend Robert Moore, a Catholic priest, B. Charney Vladek, a socialist, and Louis Pink, a self-acclaimed idealist in public housing, as board members. Not surprisingly, the first years of NYCHA were characterized by a high level of utopianism and wishful thinking. Its actions were devoted primarily to slum clearance and a quest for an ideal model of what could replace these undesired dwellings. Due to limited budget and lack of experience in construction, NYCHA built far less than it destroyed, a rather odd turn of events which contributed to the growing crisis in housing shortage. But even, though, even then, although not in a very effective way, NYCHA was going in the right direction. I will briefly discuss three major project, projects that were the fruits of this newly established housing authority. Uh, here you can see uh, photos from these three projects. Uh, the first one, aptly named First Houses, was erected in 1936 and was supposed to be a combination of new buildings and restored ones inserted in a typical urban tissue of the dilapidated tenement district of the Lower East Side. Given the difficulties resulting from the poor physical state of the existing buildings that were to be restored, ultimately NYCHA tore down most of the structures on site, leaving only some single walls and foundations on which completely new buildings were constructed. At a first glance, they look cheap, 
with harsh brick walls, deprived of any ornamentation and geometrical cubic design. Yet inside, its residents could enjoy, among others, quality oak floors and brass-like fixtures. It is worth mentioning that it was the first publicly funded project for the poor that could boast of permanent access to fresh air. Although everything looked rather modestly, as Nicholas Dagen Bloom observed, in that case, and here I quote, beauty would be measured in hours of sunlight, breezes, and sanitary conditions rather than ar architectural innovation, end quote. Other two projects realized in the first phase of NYCHA's existence were ha Harlem River Houses and Williamsburg Houses. They both cons consisted of four-story walk-up buildings of reinforced concrete. The buildings covered only 32% of these projects' grounds, allowing for even better air circulation. Furthermore, Williamsburg houses were not put parallel to the street lines, creating a tilt that made them detached from the surroundings and allowing for even greater enjoyment of the open spaces. It was the first hint of the superblock design with low land coverage and complete disruption of the old street grid something that was favored by modernist architects, such as Le Corbusier or Walter Gropius. Uh, the apartments were designed to even higher standards than first houses. The buildings included soundproof tiles, bronze hardware, wooden kitchen floors, and plaster walls, and also closet doors, which is very important. You will see why. Uh, at Williamsburg, Williamsburg houses, there were only two apartments per landing, so each building had to accommodate up to eight staircases. Obviously, these projects proved to be very costly. Even though NYCHA could use some help provided by the New Deal relief programs, especially when recruiting the construction workforce, high standard interior design turned out to be way too expensive. As Langdon Post observed himself, these houses were built without specific relation to construction costs to the rent paying ability of the prospective tenants. NYCHA had to look for cheaper solutions if it wanted to create a well functioning city wide system of public housing. But yet another momentum for NYCHA came already in 1937 with the adoption of a brand new Federal Housing Act known as the Wagner Housing Act. It established a Federal housing, Public Housing Authority, United States Housing Authority, uh, which aim was to make loans, grants, and annual contributions to local public housing agencies to develop, acquire, and manage housing projects. Although it was the first serious attempt at regulating public housing on federal level, this piece of legislation had some disadvantages. As most of the conservatives feared that public housing, especially when federally backed, would constitute a real competition to the private real estate market, a couple of incentives were added to the act in order to make it more difficult and more complicated for local housing authorities to construct new projects. Uh, first of all, the Act put a ceiling on the income of tenants eligible for public housing accommodation. It was much lower than NYCHA's previous ones, regulated by the city and the state laws. It also regulated construction costs per housing unit, and this policy drastically diminished the possibilities of experimental design and high standard fixtures typical for the first NYCHA's projects. Furthermore, the Act demanded that one slum unit had to be cleared for every public housing unit built in order to accelerate the slum clearance. Taking into account all of these setbacks, the Wagner Act nevertheless had a rather ambitious plan to construct 50,000 units per year. Soon it became clear that on a national level it was too ambitious as only a few years after the adoption of the Act, the focus of American politics shifted towards the war effort, which effectively cut most of the federal subsidies for public housing. But even though the general political climate of the mid-40s was not favorable to public housing, NYCHA was able to proceed with its experiments. Using three different sources using three different sources of funding, city, state, and federal, it constructed a lot more than other housing authorities across the country that were relying primarily on USHA's grants. Uh, this strategy allowed much more independence for NYCHA when it comes to design, site location, or even tenant selection. Now let's take a look at some of the prime examples of NYCHA projects constructed in the period between 1937 and 1949. Uh, Red Hook in Brooklyn is one of the best examples of cost-cutting policies that, uh, of that period. This project, composed of six-story buildings, was the first one that included elevators. Even though it sounds rather luxurious, these were skip-stop elevators that stopped only at the first, third, and fifth floors. A feature that would be replicated in many buildings, even much taller ones, built afterwards. 
As the project was federally funded, it had to follow all of the USHA's guidelines relating to economic design. In this case, the standard of apartments was much lower than in the previous projects. Piping was cast into concrete floors that were simultaneously the ceilings of apartments below. Only one closet per apartment had a door, and side lights replaced ceiling lights. The buildings themselves were cross-shaped, which allowed to concentrate all of the amenities, such as elevators, in the core of each structure. Similar cost-effective features could be found at Queensbridge houses, with 26 six-story Y-shaped buildings designed to form clusters surrounded by leafy oases and athletic houses on the Lower East Side. Uh, in order to make the construction even less expensive, NYCHA decided to experiment with higher densities and taller buildings. East River Houses was the first project to introduce taller towers with a mix of 6, 10, and 11-story buildings. It was believed that higher densities should be recompensed with lower land coverage, and East River is a good example of this reasoning, as only 22% of the land was occupied by structures. Low costs and higher pace of construction were the main causes for NYCHA to follow this particular model in almost all of its later projects. At that time, New York moved closer to modernist concept, but cost concerns, more than ideology, drove these innovations. Of course, by modernist concepts, I mean the famous tower in the park design proposed by Le Corbusier in the 1920s. Nature's actions from the 40s can be described as further experimentation in design and most importantly in economizing. But the authority was innovative in yet another aspect. Already at first houses, prospective tenants were subject to an elaborate selection system. This device was supposed to yield tenants ideally suited to benefit from such an ideal housing. Each candidate was examined based on seven categories with a specific number of points given for each of them. And these included income, family, employment, present accommodation, previous residence, rent habits, and social background. And even though it seems a rather discriminatory policy, it was a great tool of allowing only those who were able to take care of the new apartments to benefit from NYCHA's projects. And in a few minutes, uh, or more, half an hour, uh, I will reveal to you that this entire experiment, experimental phase in the history of NYCHA turned out, turned out to be one of the reasons of its very survival over the next decades. Um, okay, and now let's pass to the heyday of modernism. Uh, so. 1950s, and uh, the Housing Act of 1949, uh, which allowed uh, the modernist transformation of uh, most of American cities, and probably is uh, the most important piece of legislation uh, in American urbanism. Uh, the Housing Act of 1949, although dealing with public housing, brought a real revolution in yet another field of urban planning. Title one which established the principles of the process of urban renewal was the most important part of the act. Its main objective was to formally provide American cities with an opportunity for slam clearance and modernization by allocating federal subsidies for this purpose. According to Title I, a city participating in the program was responsible with the clearing of a slum land and the relocation of its residents. The whole clearing process was possible thanks to the use of the principle of eminent domain which allowed municipalities to legally acquire private tracts of land for the social and infra infrastructural benefit of the city. After doing so, private developers were able to acquire the site and build new structures on it, mainly middle-class apartments and public facilities such as hospitals, universities, or cultural centers. In a sense, the most innovative part of this piece of legislation was in the short public-private effort to eradicate slum districts from the urban fabric of American cities. It is not possible, though, to understand the act's real significance without looking at the trends in urbanization at that time. The most important one was a massive migration towards the suburbs. It was facilitated by the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, which gave the official support to the view that the 16 million GIs of the World War II should return to civilian life with, uh, with a home of their own. And to make it possible, it created the Veterans Administration Mortgage Program. Never in the history of the United States was it easier to fulfill one of the fundamental elements of the American dream, the home ownership. And the pace of suburbanization was extraordinary. It was further accelerated by some factors creating a positive image of the suburbs, mainly the fact that African Americans were not allowed to benefit from the program of mortgages, 
it allowed to create a brand new dimension of a purely white middle class paradise just outside the city limits. Such a radical racial segregation lured so many people to abandon their city lives and move to the suburbs that the health phenomenon is known as the white flight. The significance of Title I can be better understood also after looking at its political context. The Housing Act of 1949 was adopted only one year before the eruption of the major post-war crisis in Korea that intensified the rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. Cold War rapidly became one of the most ardent issues of the international political scene. From that perspective, urban renewal can be regarded as a mechanism promoting broad, well-organized development practices that are leading not only to improve the situation of central cities, but also to mark the superiority of capitalism over communism. Such reasoning becomes obvious when looking at numerous modern structures built in the 50s and 60s related to culture or to politics, such as the UN headquarters uh, or Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, which you can see right behind me. Uh, although it was very clear that Title I was the flagship program of the, United, uh, of the Housing Act of 1949, there, was also, there were also some provisions fitted specifically for housing the poor strata of American city dwellers. Title III assured provision of federal monies to support the expansion of public housing system. It authorized grants and loans necessary to build more than 800,000 new low-rent housing units over the next six years. And of course it took more than 20 years to uh, to reach that number. However, these provisions were not as elaborate and well financed as those for Title I projects, and they covered only 10% of the estimated needs for public housing nationally. Title III put similar requirements on local housing authorities as did the 1937 Act. In this case, though, the ceilings on construction costs and tenant incomes were even more drastic, especially in the context of NYCHA's history with not so poor tenants. It also demanded that rents in public housing should be at least 20% lower than the lowest rents for comparable private housing available in the vicinity. It is worth noticing that although in many points Title III repeated the Housing Act of 1937, it was still important for the development of public housing as it was the first serious federal contribution to the cost after the war. Thanks to the great array of experiments held by NYCHA in the first phase of its history, it was much better prepared to handle the requirements of the new Housing Act than most of the local housing authorities across the country. Contrary to the cities like Philadelphia, Chicago or neighboring Newark, New York didn't have to waste precious time figuring out what kind of, pub, uh, what kind of building design would best suit federal requirements and at the same time appeal to its new residents. This advantage resulted in the fact that NYCHA could obtain federal subsidies faster and as a consequence built more than any other local authority. Furthermore, at the beginning of the 50s, Robert Moses, although not officially the head of NYCHA, had already accumulated such power that he could easily appoint his most trusted aides to NYCHA's boards. As Robert Caro, his famous biographer, noted, and here I quote, not a brick of one of those housing projects was laid without Moses' approval. As he was also the chairman of the Slum Clearance Committee that was responsible for the site selection and construction process in all of the projects sponsored by the federal subsidies from the Housing Act, having his men at the Public Housing Authority gave him unprecedented control over all of slum clearance procedures in the city. With such a power, he was able to coordinate the entire transformation of New York according to his own undisrupted vision. In many cases, it signified that NYCHA's projects were built mainly to accommodate those who had to be relocated from the Title I development sites, but it, all, but it is too much to say that Moses treated NYCHA only as a kind of storage for those New Yorkers who happened to live on the path of his site of progress. And of course, even after the implementation of the Housing Act of 1949, NYCHA was still partially relying on city and state funds, which were not tied to such exigent instructions as the federal ones. Nevertheless, it is worth looking precisely at what was built with the federal subsidies. East Harlem is one of the prime examples of a neighborhood that underwent drastic metamorphosis in the 1950s. With 164 acres covered by 15 housing projects consisting of 141 towers and 16,475 apartments, it is a place with the highest concentration of NYCHA's projects in the entire city. Similar broad transformations occurred in many unpopular 
and dilapidated tenement districts that were des designated for slum clearance already in the 30s, such as Brownsville, Lower East Side, or South Bronx. Uh, when it comes to the design of these projects sponsored by the Housing Act of 1949, it is crucial to note that they marked the ultimate shift from idealism to pragmatism. There was no more place for small quiet projects such as Harlem River houses, nor for any type of experimentation. Each and every building had to follow Title III guidelines. As a result, the interior, the interior design was of much lower standard than previously. Although city and state funded projects could still boast of closet doors, toilet seats and showers, federally funded apartments were not as well equipped. Apart from the absence of closet doors, some of the preeminent new features of these projects were whole, whole floors laid with bare concrete and great sea asphalt tile floors in the apartments. Uh, you can see uh, these are uh, the great sea asphalt tile tiles. Uh, and uh, quite an interesting fact about them, apart from the fact that they're not uh, very pleasant to look at, uh, is that they're made of asbestos, so they're not uh, very healthy. Um, exterior designs were also quite bleak. All of the buildings were constructed in the so-called red brick modernism, which by some critics is referred to as red brick anti-architecture, because of its complete lack of refinement when compared to other architectural styles. It can even be said that the most important characteristic of this style is that it has no characteristics, apart from the austere simplicity. It was the effect of Nietzsche's new politics in adopting the design that would conform to the most effective use of elevators and to economical fireproof construction. Whereas in the 40s, Nietzsche was using mainly X-shaped buildings. In the 50s, it preferred slab, slab form. Um, so, this kind of building. Uh, with one elevator shaft connected to as many as 30 apartments on one floor with long corridors. And you can see it right here in this picture. There is uh, an elevator shaft with staircases and long corridors. Uh, such buildings were often grouped to form an alphabet design of Y, X and L-shaped clusters. As Nitro suddenly had to accommodate masses of relocates from slum clearance sites, it abandoned once and for all the walk-up design constructing only towers ranging from 6 up to 30 stories high. Another common feature of these slab buildings was their east-west orientation that facilitated catching the breezes and exposed them to either morning or evening sun. Taller buildings also meant that the land coverage was shrinking. At Washington houses with 12 and 14 story towers, permanent structures covered only 14 of the project's premises, 14% of the project's premises. Um, and here you can see uh, a map showing the uh, Harlem uh, neighborhood, part of the East Harlem neighborhood, uh, prior to the construction of the housing projects and after the construction. Uh, land, low land coverage was very typical for the superblock design that Nigel Holt hardly adopted for all of its 1950s projects. Just as the simple towers stood in a stark contrast to the old tenements, superblock design was a definite rupture with the traditional street patterns. According to the Tower in the Park scheme, it shifted the center of the community life from the streets to the green expanses of the housing projects, supposedly making it a safer place for children to play and for adults to relax. In a sense, this design was also supposed to shift the residents' focus from the unfriendliness of Nigel's monolithic buildings. And it is crucial for the discussion of the architecture of public housing in America to know that this change of priorities was dictated not by architects or urban planners, but by the federal government. This kind of design was responding chiefly to the economic aspect of urban renewal's idealism. In the first years following the adoption of the Housing Act of 1949, Nitro's administrators were most concerned with numbers, let it be the numbers of new dwellings or the diminishing costs of construction. Not much attention was put to social concerns, and unfortunately, it backfired already in the next decade. So, what were the problems with public housing? The main causes of these poor design standards and Nigel's focus on finances, rather than realization of its idealistic housing reform from the 30s and 40s, are at least twofold. First of all, as I have already mentioned, public housing, although a problem of major importance, was prone to changing trends in the allocation of federal monies. 
In the 1940s, the entire pro program introduced by the 1937 Wagner Act was stripped of all federal subsidies due to the war effort. And the allocations from the 1949 Act encountered similar setbacks as the Korean War erupted. Truman's administration had to cut most of the funds limiting the pace of public housing construction to mere 50,000 units annually as opposed to 135,000 units envisioned by Title III. Furthermore, there was also a typical Cold War rationality for undermining the issue of public housing, and it was the fear of communism. Numerous opponents attacked the very idea of federally funded housing for the poor as being a severe negation of American concept of individuality. Such negative comments referring to the communist threat posed by public housing gained more attention towards the end of the 40s as the Cold War started to become the defining issue of American politics. Prior to the adoption of the 1949 Act, some conservatives claimed that public housing was an entirely foreign way to organize living arrangements, a collectivist stain on independent American soil. Given the uninspiring designs of the 1950s projects, even the most vocal supporters of public housing called them tombstones of democracy, while others, most notably Catherine Bauer, admitted that what Americans really wanted was a freestanding house and a yard. Perceiving public housing as a representation of communist ideals, contradictory to American individualism, strengthened, strengthened the notion of suburbanization and as a favorite form of post-urban, post-war urban development. I'm sorry. Centrifugal white flight was, de uh, was deepened by the steps undertaken by Eisenhower's administration, who, not surprisingly, disliked public housing. He diminished Title III allocations to the point where only 35,000 units could be constructed annually. Moreover, the, uh, he further undermined the importance of housing in the urban renewal program and shifted its focus to car dependency with the 1956 Highway Act that enabled the construction of an interstate highway system with 90% of the roads built with federal subsidies. This piece of legislation contributed to an even greater outflow of the white middle class residents to the Levitt towns scattered around major American cities. As a result, the inner cities were left with majorly poor African-American and Hispanic populations. Not surprisingly, public housing projects started becoming ghettos for discriminated non-white urban poor. Even though the situation was not as alarming in New York City as, for instance, in Detroit, it was clearly visible that neighborhoods with high concentration of NYCHA's projects were gradually de-whitening. But of course, some of the problems with public housing resulted from its poor design strictly correlated with the federal instructions of construction. Low standard apartments, slow, uh, low standard apartments, slow skip stop elevators, cheap materials, and the famous lack of closet doors were only one side of the issue. More alarming was what new projects did to the traditional urban fabric and community relations of the old tenement districts. As put by one of the social workers from East Harlem, Natchez projects were generally islands of hope but as they lacked virtually any natural social services that would help organize some communal bonds, they remained such islands, completely detached from the, their urban context. Growing anonymity was even harder to cope with, as most of Nietzsche's projects were in fact nothing more than residential monocultures. Construction of only one project, Washington Houses in East Harlem, eradicated not only slum dwellings, but also, among others, 14 groceries, 14 candy stores, 11 clothing stores, 11 bakeries, 8 barber shops, 4 bars, 7 restaurants, 2 liquor stores, 2 drug stores, 4 butchers, 3 cheese shops, a plumber, a pet shop, and a fortune teller. Uh, all of that was replaced by residential towers in the park. And Jane Jacobs, a writer famous for her attacks on urban renewal policies, shrewdly observed that these last stores formed the missing link in city redevelopment as such abandonment of commerce was creating a deeper sense of isolation and a mere dormitory instead of a well-organized neighborhood community. Superblocks, although hygienic and providing lots of fresh air and sunlight, could not serve as replacements for the community that had been organizing itself or in shops, cafes, or bars for many decades. In these new projects, vibrant social life gave way to emptiness. Another factor that contributed to the demise of numerous housing projects across the country 
was admissions, admission policies. Although the 1949 Housing Act was a very clear, it was very clear that public housing should accommodate only the poorest city dwellers, some kind of screening program could have proved beneficial in the long-term perspective. For instance, Chicago Housing Authority admitted mostly families of single or single mothers uh, with many children. In relation to its humongous housing projects, much bigger than those in New York City, such admittance policy proved to be lethal. By the late 1960s, the overall, overall youth density uh, in these projects was close to 2.5 or over 2 youths for each adult. This figure can explain the levels of delin delinquency and number of youth gangs that ravaged the premises of public housing projects in the city. But kids were also problematic in New York. After moving to the projects, parents could no longer supervise them all day long, as playgrounds were not visible from the windows of most of the apartments. Unsupervised corridors turned out to be much more fun than ill-equipped playgrounds, uh, and elevators and staircases became the new sources of excitement for the majority of the project's children. Also related to the issue of admission policies was the problem of the growing numbers of welfare tenants, who in many cases brought into the projects not only their poverty, but also various social problems like drug addictions or violence. As observed by one of the social workers, many of them lacked a sense of civic responsibility. The issue was sarcastically and aptly addressed in the words of an anonymous man interviewed by Fortune magazine's reporter. Once upon a time, we thought that if we could only get our problem families out of those dreadful slums, then Papa would stop taking dope, Mama would stop chasing around, and Junior would stop carrying a knife. Well, we've got them in a, new, in a nice new apartment with modern kitchen and a recreation center, and they're the same bunch of bastards they always were. Uh, with a gradual outflow of wealthier tenants that were replaced by more problematic ones and a growing reluctance of federal government to support the cause of public housing, housing authorities had to face the virtual lack of funds for maintenance. As a result, numerous projects fell apart uh, and the vac vacancy rates started rising in the mid-60s. In most of American cities, this turn of events led to the ultimate disillusionment with public housing and more precisely with the high-rise modernist residential architecture. One of the most notorious examples of such, of, of such a failed project was the pruitt Ico estate in St. Louis that due to violent crime and dilapidation had to be demolished in 1972. For many years, this particular event was hailed as a turning point in urban planning across America. For many critics, most notably Charles Jenks, the demolition of Pruitt Ico symbolized the definite end to modernism. Tower and Depart design was rejected as inhumane and too intrusive, leaving most of the still standing public housing projects to decay. But there is one place in the US where the 1970s and 1980s, as much as difficult, were not the final years of modernist public housing. And of course, this place is New York City. So, why exactly NYCHA towers were so exceptional? Why its public housing projects are still regarded as useful and cherished by almost half a million of their residents. There are numerous factors thanks to which NYCHA was able to become more successful than housing authorities in other cities. All of them seem to spring from the assumption that public housing should not be treated just as, the, as a warehouse for the poor, something that wasn't so obvious elsewhere. As an extension of this line of thinking, the most evident difference lies in NYCHA's approach to maintenance of its projects. As of 2014, nearly 13,000 full-time employees were taking care of NYCHA's grounds. Even in the 70s and 80s, when NYCHA was experiencing its nadir, well-paid task force comprised of carpenters, painters, elevator servicemen, or gardeners was able to respond to the project's residents' needs in a relatively timely manner. Apart from, there, from them, each NYCHA's project has always had a small number of on-site permanent caretakers responsible for the tidiness and immediate response to residents' grievances. Moreover, from the 1952 up until 1995, NYCHA had its own police force, the Housing Authority Police Department. Adopted by Fritz Ambach, the creation of HAPD was strictly related to the superblock design that broke with the traditional street grid as public housing became isolated from the services provided by the NYPD, particularly as, the, that, as that department increasingly shifted to what it turned a radio motor patrol style of policy. 
As a result, project's grounds were not only physically detached from the surrounding areas, but also from the safety guaranteed by the constant presence of police patrols. Although HAPP started just as a small addition to the fast system of NYCHA's workers, uh, it was growing steadily and comprised more than 2,000 patrolmen in the late 1980s. What was distinctive about this independent police force was that most of its members were min minorities, as opposed to NYPD, which was majorly white. Also, 20% of HAPD officers were NYCHA's tenants, which gave them greater insight into the inner workings of the projects. And thanks to these two factors, HAPD was always perceived by public housing tenants as a great asset in protecting the peaceful development of their communities. Another thing that helped NYCHA survive the hardships of the 70s and 80s was its admissions policy. Contrary to other American cities, New York's public housing was not designated to provide dwellings for the poorest residents depending on welfare checks. The, authori the authorities' aim uh, in its early years was not to accommodate the poorest, but rather those who lived in awful conditions and had enough money to rent higher standard apartments once they were constructed. In short, NYCHA's mission was to provide housing for the working poor. Such a specific profile of a favored prospective tenant led to the emergence of intricate selection programs which I have already discussed. This kind of selectivity had to be replaced with less strict admissions after 1949 and ultimately abandoned in the late 60s, 60s due to the new federal government policies that ordered public housing to become the housing of the last resort and to take thousands of welfare recipients in. Although it meant that all of a sudden NYCHA had to cope with an influx of problematic papas, mamas and juniors, most of its projects were well maintained and had decent tenants who knew how to take care of their surroundings. And this tendency to favor self-sufficient tenants when combined with a vast array of community programs proved to be very helpful in maintaining social order. Apart from the preference in accommodating working class, NYCHA's policies were also characterized by deliberate diversification of its tenants. Caring about heterogeneous tenancy had at least two positive consequences. First, NYCHA's projects were not as stigmatized with racial bias as other housing agencies in the country. As opposed to Chicago, Philadelphia or St. Louis housing authorities, New York's authority was nev never minority oriented. In fact, up until the late 1950s, most of the projects remained occupied by more than 50% white tenants. While looking at the statistical data and racial composition of the projects, it becomes clear that NYCHA was following the changes occurring on a wider city scale and the general racial distribution trends initiated by the white flight. It was visible, especially in the federal and state projects, where the percentage of black and Hispanic residents started augmenting after the implementation of strict income rules. As NYCHA depended on funds city funds to build its projects, it could also boast of a more economically diverse profile of its tenants. In general, city-sponsored projects, which didn't have to follow federal and state instructions, were considered most luxurious, often composed of lower buildings with higher rents and, of course, full sets of closet doors, uh, and moreover, in the 1950s, uh, the authority and Robert Moses were eager to erect middle-income Title I projects in close proximity to public housing. In many cases, these types of economic and racial diversification helped, helped prevent the creation of homogeneous clusters of poverty and hopelessness. And the last difference uh, that I will address is seemingly not as important as the previous ones, but I think it is worth mentioning as it proves nicely that NYCHA's attitude towards its residents was better than elsewhere. This difference is landscaping. In most of American city, uh, cities, tower in the park design looked more like a tower in the asphalt car park hellhole, but this was not the case of New York City's projects. NYCHA invested thousands of dollars to make its project's grounds look as nice and leafy as possible. Only in the 1950s, the authority planted over one million miscellaneous shrubs and trees. Uh, here, behind me, uh, you can see uh, more elaborate statistics on that. Uh, now let's have a look uh, at some New York's projects and compare them to uh, the projects in other American cities. Uh, okay, so here we have uh, two examples from the 1950s. Uh, although 
you can't see much trees in here, uh, but uh, we can see a beautiful experimental playground. And there are trees, uh, really young trees, uh, just next to it. Uh, also, uh, some of the Niger's uh, projects were dotted with sculptures or various forms of uh, visual art, which is not very common uh, in other cities. Uh, and here's some more recent photos uh, with trees everywhere. And you can see uh, how this tower in the park design really looks like. Uh, here is a photo from East Harlem, uh, Vladek houses. And two photos uh, below represents, uh, represent uh, uh, community gardens uh, in Niger's projects, uh, something that is very, very uh, distinctive. Uh, of Niger's policies. And now let's, oh yeah, and here you can see how people are very happy that they can uh, plant their own vegetables. Uh, uh, and now let's move to Chicago. Uh, Cabrini Green, one of the two uh, most notorious projects in the city. Uh, you can see that there are virtually no trees, only four or maybe five of them in this picture. Uh, and the most uh, distinctive feature here is the, this vast uh, field of grass. No playgrounds, nothing actually. Uh, this is how this project looked like uh, from the air. So once again you can see that there are just a couple of trees here, but most of the, mm, of the site is, uh, uh, looks like a parking lot. And Robert Taylor Homes, also in Chicago. Once again, no trees, uh, only some shabby lawns, and a uh, playground with one set of swings, and that's all. And the rest is concrete. And the famous Pre-Digo in St. Louis. Uh, here you can see also uh, the scope uh, of uh, urban renewal in St. Louis. Uh, as the super block here covers most more than uh, 30, 30 or 40 million blocks of uh, all the tenement district. Yeah, so as you can see, these projects are quite shabby as compared to Niger's projects. And to sum up, even though modernist public housing across America can be perceived as a failure, the example of Niger's projects showed that what was at fault was certainly not architecture. Although modernist towers indeed formed one of the most radical superimposed intrusion on the traditional urban fabric of American cities, the crucial aspect of the entire problem lies far away from the sheer design. As observed by Alexander von Hoffmann, uh, Title III had a fatal flaw, a naive reliance on physical dwellings to carry out social goals. Adding to that, the numerous policies, such as mindless demolition of local businesses, demanding unprepared housing authorities to deal with the problem of the most problematic tenants, or federal support for the, for the white flag, have all contributed to the gradual downfall of public housing projects. Even as it's tempting to say that if not, if, if not architecture, then bad urban planning policies were responsible for the notorious reputation of public housing, we have to bear in mind that even these policies were shaped by federal guidelines that openly treated the problem of, uh, of housing for the poor as some kind of junior partner issue to the entire notion of urban renewal. <coughs> in this context, Niger's story shows the importance of good preparation to resolve such complicated matters as the issue of public housing. Its history can be divided into several periods or phases of experimentation. The first one can be described as a quest for a perfect design in the 30s and 40s, the second as a quest for the model tenants, and the third one as, as an experimentation with various, for, various models of financing. And contrary to Chicago or St. Louis housing authorities, it succeeded precisely because it was eager to experiment. It did not take modernism for granted as opposed to federal government. And as much as modernism itself was an experiment in terms of both architecture and social policies, Niger's activities were also a great exercise in urban planning and public housing management. And for that reason, I think it's possible to say that Niger serves as one of the best examples of what architectural modernism really stood for. And therefore, it cannot be said that modernism fell down with, with the prude Igo project because it was nothing more than just a perfect expression of a crippled and cheap version of modernism 
sponsored by the American federal government. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Please. <laughs> okay, uh, I have a question uh, concerning NYCHA projects, uh, because uh, you've mentioned some of them, and I no noticed that there were some, I mean, uh, I want to ask is were they funding all the boroughs, because you mentioned Manhattan, or the ones in Manhattan, in, in Brooklyn, because there was Williamsburg, and I think mm -hmm. Queens, and what about uh, yes, there are, uh, as far as I remember, there are 102 projects in Manhattan, uh, 100 projects in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn uh, around 80 projects in Bronx, and around 60 in, in Queens, and also in, on Staten Island, there are also like 30 projects. So it was really, uh, really broad, uh, it is a really broad system of public housing that encompasses all of the boroughs of uh, New York City. Yeah, I was wondering especially about Bronx because it's a uh, uh, well, it's a borough with a with a uh, uh, with a, a significantly different racial makeup than, than mm -hmm. the other ones. So. Yes, and uh, of course, uh, really huge parts of this uh, borough are covered with uh, NYCHA's project, but not as much as, for instance, in uh, East Harlem. Uh, the projects uh, in the Bronx are more scattered around. They're smaller, and uh, also there are a lot of projects uh, from the 30s and 40s in the Bronx. So they're smaller, and. Uh... <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Is that all? That's all. <laughs> Thank you, this was really interesting. And um, I, I would like to ask about, um, well, several questions maybe, but, but um, uh, one of the things is, uh, I mean, I, I kind of uh, uh, wonder if you could say a little bit more about the, the financing. You talked about the financing, you know, it's kind of a different forms of financing. And um, um, uh, um, I, I wonder, for example, when, when the land was cleared, you know, uh, uh, when the sounds were cleared, I mean, what did that mean? Did that mean that the land was free, basically? Or did that mean that um, it was appropriated by the city government? I mean, I, I wonder, I mean, you know, I wonder about the economics of this. And also, what, what, what does it mean to say various forms of financing? Does it mean um, that the money came from the tenants? Or does it mean something else? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, okay, let me answer the, the first question. Uh, the eminent domain, uh, it's, uh, allowed the city to uh, buy the land from uh, the private owners uh, and to clear it. And then uh, private investors, they had to buy the same land from the city government. Uh, and after that, they could uh, build some new projects on it. And of course, this, uh, cleared, uh, this land cleared of slum dwellings and everything was relatively cheap because it was sponsored uh, also by the federal government subsidies. Uh, and in that sense, it was a uh, bargain, uh, actually. Uh, and it facilitated uh, private developers to build a lot of new apartment buildings, uh, hospitals, schools, etc., etc. Uh, and the most important thing here is that uh, private developers, they were not interested in building uh, public housing for the poor uh, because it was not economical for them. Uh, and that's why uh, Title I Stand stood for uh, this kind of uh, slum clearance that was followed by uh, the construction of, uh, for instance, UN headquarters or uh, various uh, community centers, etc. Uh, and Title III was responsible for public housing only. Uh, and the second question was what was it about? Uh, uh, no, uh, various, uh, what do you mean by various forms of finance? Okay, uh, so uh, NYCHA was relying on three types of funding. First was city funds, state funds, and federal funds. And all of them were uh, related to different sets of instructions when it comes to design, when it comes to uh, I know, amounts of money that they could spend on uh, the new projects. So, for instance, city, uh, city funding was uh, the best uh, because uh, 
Okay, first of all, uh, there were not uh, a lot of regulations put on design or uh, tenant selection. Uh, but, for instance, uh, federal uh, subsidies, they were uh, correlated with this entire very strict, very strict system of uh, allocations for the cheapest forms of public housing, actually, and for the poorest residents. And that's why they look uh, differently than city sponsored projects. Do you think that, that the fact that there is a lot of demand for housing in New York mm -hmm. has had something to do with the success of NYCHA? I mean, because, I mean, it would seem that they would be able to charge, you know, higher uh, uh, rental uh, from their tenants, partly because there is such a great demand for housing, uh, compared to St. Louis, for example. Or, or yes, but at that time, uh, this problem was similar in St. Louis as well, because, uh, as you can see here, uh, well, uh, these tenement neighborhoods in St. Louis were as crowded as in New York City. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, the suburbanization allowed uh, for white residents to move out of these crowded neighborhoods. But uh, African Americans uh, and Hispanics and other uh, discriminated uh, uh, groups of people, they, uh, they still had to find uh, some new apartments inside these crowded neighborhoods. So. Uh, it's not as much the problem of uh, New York, of the demand for housing in New York City as... No, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think it's not... It's not, it's not, it's not it was not uh, one of the reasons for the success of NYCHA. Any more questions? Well, I sort of have another one, but I could ask you later as well. But maybe, because uh, you mentioned those requirements, uh, first both in NITA in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in its first phase, and there was uh, this, uh, among the uh, all the eight, there was social social background and family, and I wonder whether uh, like, what what does it mean really social background? So whether, for example, race and ethnicity were considered? Uh, because not that much at first. Uh, but uh, when it comes to social background, it means uh, whether uh, the prospective tenants they uh, like to drink, they take drugs, such things. Um, and family, of course, the number of children, uh, more like, statistical data. Uh, but race was not a factor uh, for NYCHA, at least uh, in the first uh, phase. Um, they were actually uh, doing a lot to diverse uh, to, to uh, mm, diversify uh, the tenant body, um, and even though there were some projects, as uh, for instance Williamsburg houses and Harlem River houses, that were uh, majorly black or white, uh, it depended on the uh, mostly on uh, the racial uh, mm, composition of the neighborhoods they were built in. So, for instance, in Harlem, obviously, uh, there were more blacks, so they wanted to create a public housing uh, project for the residents of this neighborhood, so it was mostly black, as opposed to, for instance, Williamsburg, which was mostly white, or Coney, Coney Island, which was 95% uh, white, and uh, still is very white, comparing to other projects in the city. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>